to the cloud. Great, so we are now officially live. Welcome again to Restorative <coughs> Justice Unpacked. So go through quickly what to expect today. We're gonna to start with a quick introduction from me about why me, what we do, what we're trying to achieve, etc. Then my colleague Morgan will run through some of the basics about what restorative justice is and we'll address some frequently asked questions together. And then you'll have a chance to just ask us some follow-up questions about that and what you've heard so far. And then we're going to go into part part two of the day, which is where I will do sort of a mock little interview with Janika, our ambassador, about her personal experience of restorative justice. And to, just to flag it up now, we'll be discussing difficult subjects, including serious domestic violence. So I think it's good to make that sort of a, a, a trigger warning, as you were. After that, you'll have a chance to ask some questions to Janika, and then the session will round up. And I know that when these sessions get really long, your brain starts to fry. So the aim is for the session to last just an hour and a half. Right, so let's get going. Let me tell you about why me. So I don't. I think there's a mix of knowledge in the room. I think some people hopefully are coming to, to Restorative Justice and Why Me for the first time. I think some people might know a fair bit about it already. I'm going to start from the basics about what Why Me is and what Restorative Justice is and assume no knowledge. So Why Me are the national charity which promotes and delivers access to restorative justice for everyone affected by crime. And our story began in March 2002, when a man named Peter broke into a man named Will's house. It was very, very unpleasant. They had a confrontation, they fought, people got hurt, and eventually Peter was arrested. And sadly, it wasn't the first time Peter had been arrested by any means. He, he reckons, when I spoke to him about it, he said he thinks he's committed probably over 20,000 crimes by that point in his life, which is mind-boggling to me, 20,000 crimes. And he was once described as a, as a walking crime wave, which he admitted he, at the time, was quite chuffed with. But in all of that time, what Peter had never done, he never appreciated, was how much damage he was actually causing to people along the way. Will, who he'd burgled on this occasion, he was frightened, he was shaken following the incident. It, it troubled him really greatly. Every time he went to open the door of his house, he imagined a figure behind there, and it really, really upset him. And luckily for Will, he was, you know, taking offered to take part in this pilot, where he was offered to meet Peter again in prison through restorative justice. And the two men met in a controlled environment. And, you know, Peter started out by making a lot of sort of... And Will thought he was trying to play a game, making excuses, sort of not really taking it seriously. But then what happened was Will basically exploded and he got incredibly angry. And he basically shouted at him. He basically said, oh, do you understand what you've done? And he listed all these harms he'd caused and he listed all this and that. And it was described as like a fire hydrant going off. And Peter, despite being a pretty hardened guy who'd seen a lot of things, he was just flabbergasted, like he was being hit by a train. Because amazingly, believe it or not, despite this whole grim life of crime he'd been leading he had never ever ever heard anything like that before you know he'd had many many lectures from police prison officers judges lawyers but he'd never ever had to sit and listen to the harm he'd caused to another human being from that human being and for him that was it so twenty thousand and done he never committed another crime again he came out of prison and he started to turn his his life around and and from will's point of view will felt so much better about what had happened to him he felt he had questions answered. He felt he'd pushed Peter to a better path. He, and he felt less afraid when he went into his house. So it's still win-win. So they thought, wow, that was incredible. That was amazing. That changed our lives. And, they, and they, they became friends, which is, you know, Hollywood stuff. So we'll then set up a charity, Why Me, with Peter's help. And they helped to make restorative justice something which more victims get offered. Because they thought, this is crazy. Like, how can this be a little experiment we were offered you know it has such great potential so they created why me and now all these years later peter and will are still friends and why me is this thriving charity that i'm really really proud to work for fighting for restorative justice to be to be used more widely we work in a number of different ways so we we campaign for restorative justice that's all the lobbying policymakers talking to politicians looking at policy documents you know really getting through all the sort of nerdy politics public affairs stuff mm. we also work with police probation, youth services, we help them improve their provision of restorative justice, help them, you know, troubleshoot things, increase their usage, etc. And we work with community groups as well to help widen access to restorative justice to sort of underrepresented groups. On top of all that, we have our own restorative justice service, which works with people affected by crime to help them move forward. So we, we offer restorative justice ourselves as well as a charity. So I find this really exciting, really great, as I would as a, as a proud member of the YME team. And I really hope that that you too, in whatever whatever your experience of 
interesting restorative justice has been, whatever's brought you here. I hope that you're open-minded and inspired by the potential of restorative justice to be a really great solution in our criminal justice system. So I'm now going to pass to my colleague Morgan, who's going to say a little bit more about like what restorative justice is and how it works. So over to you, Morgan. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Morgan. Um, I'm the communications intern at uh, YME. Um, and yeah, I just want to echo Ben and say thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate it on a Friday coming and learning about restorative justice. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about sort of what restorative justice is. Uh, yeah, so um, it's kind of quite a widely recognised concept. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. Um, but I'm going to talk about sort of it's like logistical reality in the criminal justice system um, and how it works. So um, what is restorative justice? Um, restorative justice um, allows a person harmed um, by crime to communicate with the perpetrator. Um, and this is often uh, with a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, although there actually are lots of different forms of restorative justice, uh, which I'm gonna go into more detail about later. So um, restorative justice is all about communication and opening up a dialogue between um, two, two people. Um, and it allows a victim um, of crime, um, the person harmed to ask questions, um, and explain how um, this uh, incident has impacted them. Um, they can explain how it affected them um, and they can ask questions they need to find closure um, uh, from this like traumatic event. Um, and it can be a, like an incredibly transformative process um, that can change lives, um, both for um, the person harmed and they could feel empowered to move on um, and also for the um, perpetrator of the offender um, because uh, they can understand the real impact of their actions and um, it's proven that uh, restorative justice can reduce reoffending. so it really has got a lot of positives um, for both parties. So that's sort of like in short what restorative justice is um, and I'm now going to sort of speak about how it like works in the criminal justice system. So there's sort of a misconception about restorative justice that it leads to a lighter sentence or, you know, it's an easy way out um, for offenders. And this isn't the case. Restorative justice um, runs alongside the criminal justice process. Um, and at YB, um, we facilitated um, restorative justice um, uh, meetings um, that have, and have, which have been really successful but um, in prisons, but which haven't actually reduced the sentence. So that's a big misconception about restorative justice. Um, it's also really important part of restorative justice is that it's voluntary. So you need consent from both parties before a restorative justice meeting or restorative justice can take place. And that's kind of a theme that runs through the whole restorative justice process. Um, so that's sort of how, like what it is in the criminal justice system and how it works. Um, and now I'm going to speak about kind of how the face to face meeting um, goes ahead. So once you have consent from both parties um, and like, you've decided that you would like like a face to face meeting, um, which is called a restorative justice conference, a, a, pro a long process begins um, of uh, sort of leading up to the conference and preparing both parties for um, for this event. And at the heart of this process is a trained facilitator. Uh, who acts as a mediator um, between both parties and their role is to prepare um, the victim and prepare the um, perpetrator for this for this meeting. So um, this can involve sort of asking um, the person harmed um, questions, um, managing their expectations, asking what they'd like to get out of this process um, and then sort of liaising with the perpetrator as well um, to see sort of where their head's at with everything too. Um, so only once the facilitator is um, sure that both parties are ready um, and like it's safe to do so and most of the preparations they're prepared as can be and um, then the sort of date in the diary is set for this restorative justice conference. So I think it's really important to remember that restorative justice doesn't happen overnight and the actual meeting itself is you know really really planned and highly organized so there are no surprises on the day. Um, you know it's it's organized down to like the person who arrives and the person who leaves. It's all um, like meticulously planned out. 
Um, so the art restorative justice conference itself um, will involve the, the person harmed, um, the perpetrator, two trained restorative justice facilitators, and any support um, that the victim or the perpetrator would like, which has all been previously agreed. So there, as I said, there are no surprises. And then um, they sort of sit with the facilitator in the middle and the facilitator um, will establish some ground rules of no interrupting and um, like breaks at any point. So it's sort of creating a, the whole point is to sort of facilitate a really open communication where everyone feels respected and listened to. And then we'll ask questions such as, you know, how, like, can you tell me what happened, how this affected you? Um, so yeah, all about facilitating a dialogue between both parties and opening up sort of a, a means of communication between them. And then sometimes if it's appropriate uh, as an outcome agreement, um, which is um, sort of where the victim um, or the person harm can say um, what they'd like the perpetrator to do next. So maybe this could be a, a, a rehabilitation a scheme in a prison or, you know, go to rehab. And that's obviously agreed by both parties as well. So you've got that theme of consent, um, mutual understanding running through the whole process. And then there's sort of a check-in afterwards. So that's kind of like logistically how um, the restorative justice meeting would work. Um, but as I said previously, sometimes a face-to-face -face meeting um, isn't practical or desirable or the people involved don't, don't feel like that's what they want to do. And so there are actually lots of other ways that restorative justice can happen. Um, so that could be kind of by letters, so letter exchange, um, or uh, a video, sort of re recorded videos, um, which are exchanged between a uh, person harmed and the perpetrator, answering facilitators' questions, so you don't have that face-to-face -face contact. Um, or uh, a proxy offender can be used, so that's if um, you've been harmed by a crime and you'd like to go take part in face-to-face -face restorative justice, but the offender doesn't want to, but you can meet. Um, an offender who has committed a similar crime sort of ask those same questions and find that closure that way. And then kind of more abstractly, um, for example, in the case of animal cruelty, um, a meeting might be organised with relevant charities, organisations, again, to sort of uh, make sure the impact of someone's actions is um, explained and um, a communication is opened up. So yeah, that's um, kind of in a nutshell, restorative justice um, within the criminal justice system. Um, but there's also a sort of a, a restorative approach that can be taken to resolve conflict in all um, in all sort of areas. So that could be in schools or um, in organisations and companies. Um, if there's been any conflict, you know, an incident of bullying at school, you can have that same um, restorative approach, which would involve, um, as I sort of said earlier, with the restorative justice meeting, um, encouraging open communication between both parties. Um, to share um, feelings and perspectives um, and sort of resolve like face adversity. Um, it can also be used to, as I was saying, along the shared perspectives front um, for like a listening event. So um, we hosted at YME a, um, a listening event in the wake of George Floyd's um, death, um, where we invited participants to speak about their experiences of racism in the criminal justice system. So we had a trained facilitator there, um, it was a webinar, um, asking questions to participants and if they felt comfortable they could share um, their lived experiences of racism. And this was um, really positive to sort of um, understand other people's worldviews and other people's perspectives and um, can be really positive in like sharing that like communication. Um, so yeah, that's like a restorative approach and restorative justice in a nutshell. I hope that all makes sense. And as Ben said, there's going to be an opportunity shortly to ask any questions. Um, so I'm now going to ask Ben some frequently asked questions about restorative justice. Um, so the first one is, um, is restorative justice a replacement for punishment? Thanks, Morgan. Um, yeah, so as you touched on, RJ can be used for any type of crime. And it can be used either post-sentencing or earlier in the process, regardless that both parties and all participants are happy to take part. It is not a replacement for other interventions, so it, it works alongside them. So if someone commits a, a very serious crime, just because they're taking part in restorative justice, they probably still, I mean, they'll still serve prison time, maybe RJ will take place in prison, etc. And if they've agreed to do a restorative process, that takes place alongside their sentence. 
However, for, for sort of minor crimes, restorative justice is sometimes used as part of a package of like an out-of-court disposal package, which diverts cases away from courts and focuses on repairing harm. But it's always, you know, an option which is voluntary from both parties, part of a wider package. It's not just there as a, instead of this, we'll do RJ. You know, it's a, it's, it's part of a, a, a wider suite of options that can be involved in out-of-court disposals and, and helping to rehabilitate, essentially. So short answer, no, RJ is not generally a replacement for punishment, but in some cases it can be used as part of diversion schemes which, which help to keep cases out of court, out of prison, et cetera, for minor crimes. Um, my turn to ask you a question, Morgan. If you take part in restorative justice, do you have to forgive the perpetrator? Um, the short answer to that is no. Uh, forgiveness is a personal choice. So um, restorative justice um, is a very personal thing and obviously like, it's a case by case thing um, and you're never pressured to forgive anyone. Um, it can still be a really positive experience um, and have positive outcomes even if um, there's no forgiveness involved. Um, so now I'm going to ask Ben a question. Um, is restorative justice only appropriate for minor crimes? Uh, no, not at all. And this is sometimes something that people make assumptions about restorative justice, and it's kind of tied to the assumption that it's a replacement for punishment. It's sort of a, you know, what the Daily Mail will tell you, a sort of a light touch for soft punishment. But, but no, not at all. And we'll hear from Ginny Kalata, who is a victim of quite serious crime. A very serious crime. <laughs> if both parties want to take part in restorative justice and train facilitators think it's safe, the process should go ahead regardless of the type of crime. And different police areas are more open to this than others there are still certain crime types where there's sort of a hesitancy from some in the, in police in some areas to use restorative justice, but this is often down just to misconceptions and fears. And the reality is why me has ambassador, you know, we work with people who are ambassadors who have been victims of the most serious crimes and gone through restorative justice. And to be honest, you know, when you've been affected by a very, very serious crime, your need for recovery is greater because of the, the harm is greater. So therefore, the potential of restorative justice is actually even greater than it is for sort of minor crimes. People have to make the assumption for. So RJ is a tool which can be used to tackle all types of offending as long as it's seen as appropriate in both parties, both parties' consent. Okay, final question from me before we open up to questions from from the floor, uh, Morgan. Despite having said all this, is it safe to meet the perpetrator through restorative justice? Yes, it's it's completely safe. Um, as I said, the facilitator will only allow restorative justice to go ahead if um, if it's safe to do so. And obviously, the whole process in the, is in the hands of a of a trained facilitator. So it's a really safe and controlled process. Thanks, Morgan. Okay, so you've heard a lot from me and Morgan. I know ears on these things. We're now going to ask if you have any questions. I think the best way to do this is I'm going to just we'll just leave it silent for a minute or so. If you hit the more button at the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat function. So I think probably the best way is to type questions you have in the chat and I will address them. And then I'll work through the questions one by one along the side or me and Morgan will talk about them. And it's probably easier than sort of the, the, the quasi hands up process of, of these big Zoom calls. So go ahead and start typing any questions if you have any. We've got one question through from Don who has asked if anyone has seen the series The Redemption Project on Crime and Investigation Channel on Sky, as it's about RJ taking place in prisons. I haven't seen it, Dom. Morgan, Janika, have you, have you seen it? No, but I feel like it's one to watch. Yeah, it seems like it's something that you need to watch. I need to watch that tonight. My friend told me about it yesterday. She's like, you need to watch it. And I was like, I'll be watching that tonight. So I haven't watched it yet, but apparently it's very good. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's quite a few, you know what, there's quite, we actually at Wyoming get, get contacted from quite a few sort of journalists and production companies who, there's this real human interest to RJ that doesn't always exist with other sort of criminal justice interventions, but you know, it's really great. I know it's an American thing. That's so much of our TV is done. I think we can, we can, we can swallow <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, thanks Claire. Is there an average time the process takes from start to finish? Oh, it's a bit of a piece of string question and it really depends. I mean, it's just a really naff answer, but it's the truth. And it really depends on the case. So if you've got a comparatively simple case, let's say it's a, relatively minor crime you know you just they both agree to take part you probably will facilitate it will meet with each party a couple of times have a conversation they, and they bring them together if you've been the victim of quite a serious crime 
it's complicated. There's lots of safety considerations. Then I, it, you know, it can often take longer. And the facilitator is, as Morgan talked about, the facilitator is trained. And having worked with RJ facilitators, they are safety conscious people. They're risk averse people. They they are thorough people. So if there's a a, a case which is quite complex, they'll be very very keen not to rush anything and to go through it. Also important to add with things like COVID. Obviously, there can be practical problems in terms of when a meeting can be arranged, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a piece of string thing, I'm afraid. But it's the most important thing about RJ, I think, is that it's it's, it's led by the participants and especially, especially the, the, the victim of crime. So it can be steered. It can be flexible around your needs. Um, let me have a look at some of the questions. So do you know roughly how many people are benefiting from RJ in the UK at the moment? Is the number rising and gaining traction politically? Good question, Kiara. So why me publishes a paper called Valuing Victims, which basically goes through the stats about RJ across the country. And I haven't got like a number in my head right now. But what I will say is that in the victim's code of practice, if you're a victim of crime and there is a known offender, then you are entitled to be informed about restorative justice. Now, the reality is surveys find that about 5% of people in this position actually recall being informed about restorative justice. So the non-numerical answer is it does happen. It's not, it's not like it was when Peter and Will got involved. It is something which, you know, I've got, I was chatting to Morgan the other day, you know, and you think about it, like I've got a, my mum's cousin's friends had RJ just by coincidence. No, normally I chat to my friend and they go, oh yeah, my someone, someone. It's not an unheard of thing, but we would like to make it much, much, much more common. And that 5% number is a good indication. 5% of victims of crime where there's a known offender recall being offered restorative justice or talked about restorative justice. And that, that's too low. Um, as, as for whether it's gaining traction politically, I think it probably, I think it is among certain groups. And I think conversations around changing criminal justice in general are very topical at the moment, but it is always difficult and it depends on government priorities and everything else. Have you ever come across a case where RJ has not been as effective as hoped? In which case, what happens next? Are there further interventions? So thanks, Sophie. In terms of RJ not being effective, so big, big study found about 85% of victims of crime come out of the process and think, that was good. I was good. They're satisfied with it, which means 15% don't. And there's some cases where RJ is not effective just because maybe it wasn't actually handled that well every now and then. Obviously, there's like in anything, there's sometimes bad practice, but most of the time, I'd say it's personal. You know, we're dealing with people's emotions here. Sometimes you come out on RJ meeting and you go, that wasn't for me. But what doesn't happen very often at all, I mean, we never say never, but is, is that someone's, you know, harmed by it. You know, when you hear cases where someone's not happy with it, normally it's just they felt, ah, oh, I didn't get much out of that. As for what happens next and further interventions, it really depends on the case. So if you're dealing with someone who's, you know, someone's been in prison for many, many years, you meet them through RJ and it hasn't helped you, there might not be a next step necessary. But if it's, let's say it's an out of court disposal and they've said, right, you need to do this restorative intervention as part of your package. There's some cases where it might be if it just didn't go ahead properly or the sort of the perpetrator pulled out or didn't do it properly, it can then be returned for for more considerations from about sort of where the, what other interventions can be offered and where they can be diverted. But as seems to be the answer to every one of the questions, I apologize. It does depend on the case. How does it fit with sentencing guidelines and sentencing options? Uh, yeah. So actually, there's a, the bill recently, the sentencing bill that Morgan and I have been looking into, which the government's recently released, does talk about RJ and sentencing a fair bit. And it's actually worth a read. And they talk about how delaying the time between conviction and sentencing could offer more opportunities for restorative justice. But fresh off the consultation in Parliament that we've got lots of follow up questions we need to ask about how that actually works. At the moment, in terms of sentencing guidelines, RJ doesn't tend to be like part of a sentence because it's 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 voluntary so it can it can be but it takes place normally post sentence so it can be once someone's already had a sentence or can, or serving their sentence or as an out of court option uh well, i'll just keep, keep working through to make sure i can get through these uh doreen we will be working with the police force and local community using a restorative approach to mend relationships do you believe that RJ develops positive relationships and can inform the need for training? Yeah, I'd say I do. And I'm really interested to hear more about, about that project. Um, as Morgan spoke about earlier, there's, there's restorative 
justice and restorative approaches are, you know, restorative justice is the formal kind in the criminal justice system, but restorative approaches can be used very widely in a, a wide range of, of, of settings. And I think absolutely they can help develop positive relationships. Inform the need for training. I'm not quite sure what sort of exactly in the context you mean that, but but I do definitely think it can develop positive relationships. Okay. Um, it's working through. Sandra said, where would one typically meet the perpetrator? Would it be in jail when the person is incarcerated? Is it possible to do RJ after they're released? If yes, how would the process be different? So yeah, it depends. <laughs> Sorry. So RJ can take place in prison. If someone's currently serving a sentence, it will. In other cases, it, it will be held, you know, you'll discuss, because it's meant to be victim-led, you'll discuss with the, the participants where a good place is. What, what it will be is it will be a, a secure location with staff present. It's not going to be in like the park unless there's a very, very good reason or a significant reason. You know, it's in a it's in a, a secure location, an official location. And if it's a, uh, you know, if, if it's someone who's currently, currently curving a sent custodial sentence, it will it will be in a secure setting like a prison. Um, I've not come across the proxy offender option before. Maybe the empty chair scenario. Is proxy offender widely used? Can it cause added unresolved questions for the victim? Would obviously need an appropriate person to stand in for the real offender. Yeah, so it's, it's you know, it's not lots of these things. It varies area by area. So it, it just depends. In In lots of services, it's possibly more common to have a proxy victim because if services are sort of rehabilitation led let's say someone's committed a hate crime it's an example that we worked on recently and they've done some, and, and, and the and the victim of that hate crime didn't want to take part some rj services have some sort of diversion scheme so they go okay you do a restorative process let's say you have a let's say you've committed a hate crime against a muslim person it you know it's good practice let's say in an R, in a rj service if they have a a local well-known Muslim person in the community who, who takes part sometimes, they'd say, okay, maybe the victim of that hate crime can speak to that proxy person, and then that proxy person can meet with with the offend with the offender, sort of pass it on. It's not like super common practice, but it is an option that some restorative providers use. And it's something that after the project that I worked on about restorative justice and hate crime, I really think it can be a really positive thing that could be looked at more. But obviously there are many, many clauses of that. You have to, one of the important parts of facilitation is managing expectations and you need an appropriate person to stand in. Absolutely. You need to manage victim expectations. Absolutely. You know, and it would only go ahead if it's something that both, that all parties are comfortable with. Are RJ practitioners accredited or regulated? Yep. The uh, restorative justice service does an accreditation program. So that that's where the accreditation, the YME service has been accredited. Um, and also every police and crime, so every PCC area, and this is where, uh, you know, the politics of PCCs and crimes are very complicated in this country, but essentially there's 42 PCC areas in England and Wales, and each one of them has a, a, a contracted service or an in-house service, which offers restorative justice for adults. So that's sort of an officially, an, an official channel you can go through. All right, it, uh, there's a program, peer support, in a Californian prison called GRIP, and it focuses on violent offenders, making sure they talk to the victims and other violent offenders and their families and get to the bottom of why they committed their offense, such as childhood trauma. It's been shown to rehabilitate everyone in the group besides one person with a drug offense. This maybe should be used in England and Wales. Joanna, yeah, it sounds like a great thing. It sounds like the sorts of programs which are used in parts of the country and my experience in working with different areas is that it really depends and different areas do different things and those sorts of programs as you say i think they're great stuff oh taking a deep breath as i look through i think that is all the questions that were written through thanks very much sorry that i kind of uh monologued through that i was gonna um, as a as my screen keeps updating um i'll give you i'll take a deep breath and give a sec for anyone else to raise anything else they wanted to talk about um, but no, it's really, really great to hear all the different things people are asking. And one thing that we will do is after this, obviously we'll circulate information about why me. So on the, on the, <laughs> I hope you don't see this as a, as a cheeky plug, but on the feedback form, we're going to send around at the end, there's one question, which basically 
ask if you want to hear from us, be on our newsletter subscription list. We send lots of stuff about the work we're doing, information about RJ, share stories of people who have been through RJ, etc., etc. And after this, me and Morgan will be working on writing this week's edition in the afternoon. And it'd be really great if you want to put your email address in that box, because um, we'd love to be able to keep sharing more about our work and about how RJ works. If I can have your contact details, please. Okay, that's from Doreen uh, about sending this project. You know what? I can I can write my contact details just to everyone in the meeting. Ben dot Andrew at y hyphen me dot org. If anyone wants to email any questions, that's there. So Sophie Nelson says, did you say that every PCC area across England and Wales provides RJ services? So I think there's a problem in Wales at the moment where they have a problem, but in general, there is a restorative justice branch. So, you know, it doesn't mean that everyone will always get it every time, but they have someone they provide, there is a provider. So it's sometimes in-house, it's sometimes outsourced, sometimes more developed, sometimes less developed, but but there are someone in, on the widening website, you can go on what's called our RJ map and it will show who the official person to contact is for each area and, and who it is who's running that RJ service. Um, okay, I think that's that's a good a good run through. So thank you very much for your for your questions. Um, with that in mind, I think possibly Janika, it might be time to to hear from you. So I will um, introduce Janika. Uh, so Janika is a, a wonderful woman who works with YME as a restorative justice ambassador. Um, and she's been through restorative justice herself. And I think that what we're going to do to sort of share her, um, sort of hear more from her is I'm going to do a bit of a mock interview with her. And I I won't be like a Piers Morgan or, 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 or ask tough questions. I'm just guiding through her story. So Janika, first Hi. things first. Um, can you tell us about the incident that, that happened to you? Yes, of course. So in 2013, May of 2013, I finished a relationship that I'd been in for five years with my then partner. We had, I had one daughter who at the time was 13. Off previous relationship, we had together a nine month old daughter and I was nine weeks pregnant at the time with our second child. And it was an abusive relationship that I didn't realise was abusive at the time because it was more emotional abuse, mental abuse, verbal abuse. Um, and I just had enough, basically. So, and I'd got to a point where I said, I can't do this anymore, finish a relationship. We'd split up for four weeks. We'd been split up for four weeks. And I had to get a non-molestation order out on him because he kept coming around my house every morning when my eldest had gone to school and just being abusive because I wouldn't let him in. I didn't want to talk to him. And I'd gone on holiday. That We were supposed to be our first family holiday together, but I said he couldn't come anymore because we finished the relationship. And um, I took my two daughters and I went with my grandmother. I came back from the holiday. He was on the phone begging to meet, see me to see our daughter. Um, in the non station order, it did say we could meet in a public place or we could meet via his mum's house. So I met him on a car park of a gym. I had a half an hour window. I was going to collect my big daughter from school. And um, as I pulled up in the car park, my daughter fell asleep. So I was like, oh, great, I'm going to have to have a conversation with him. But I didn't have any fear. I never feared him, which is quite strange maybe to a lot of people but I, I was more scared if well, he would come into a public place and embarrass me verbally that was an embarrassment and I feared that but I wasn't fearful of him physically um so I pulled up the car it was a beautiful sunny day it's July the 1st 2013 I turned my music off took my seat back off because I thought right I'm gonna have to turn around and have a little conversation with him because my daughter's fell asleep she's in the car seat in the back and as he got in the car, he had a knife in his hand. His face was contorted. His voice sounded like something from the very, I would say, from the pit of hell. And he basically said, if you do not agree to be with me, I'm going to slit your throat and go to prison forever for killing you. And he hit me in the face, got me in a headlock, was strangling me. So obviously the... In these situations, everybody would have heard all the fight, flight or freeze response that you have. Never been in a situation, anything like this before. 
So I'm going through it in my mind thinking, oh my gosh, what is happening? What do we do? I've got my daughter. So I can't flee the scene because my daughter's strapped into the car seat. And I can't freeze in this situation because it's happening. So the only thing I can do really is fight this situation out of this situation. But I know I'm outside of a gym. I could sit, when I pulled into the car park, I could see that there was men coming in and out of the gym. So I thought all I need to do is get out of this car. If I get out of this car and scream for help, somebody will come to help me. So if that felt like it went on for forever. So he'd done that a couple of times and let me back up and strangling me again. And I was begging him and screaming to stop and saying, look, our daughter's in the back of the car. And he was just saying, we need to go somewhere. Me and you need to talk. You need to tell me that we're going to be together. And I was like, I can't. I can't say that to you. Look what you're doing to me. Just stop. Just stop it. What is wrong with you? So I managed to get out of the car, stood up, screamed at the top of my voice. Somebody please help me. He's got a knife and he's going to kill me. And it was as if the people that was in the car park at the time, five or six men, it was as if somebody pressed the pause button because everybody just froze and nobody came. And I was like, oh my gosh, no one's going to help me. And I literally, all the hope that I put into getting out of the car and getting help from these big strapping men that are going in and out of the gym just drained from my body. And I knew this realisation was no one's going to help me and I'm not going to have to fight this man and fight him off because now he's coming round to my side of the car so I'm wedged in between my door and the car, standing up. And he has come round to my side with the knife in his hand still, still raging, still furious, his face all contorted. And my heart is racing, obviously. And then I've kind of got into my car and sat on my seat with my legs up to kind of kick him away. And he's lifted up his hand like this and said, I'm going to kill you now because you don't want to be with me and it's all your fault. And just proceeded to stab at me. So he first went for my face and I put my arm up like that and the knife went straight into my arm. And then as it went into my arm and he pulled it out, I thought, this is really happening. And I've got nothing to do. I can't do anything but fight. So I'm kicking, I'm punching, I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. Never screamed like that before or since in that way. Please help me, please killing me. He's going to kill and I'm pregnant. And he's stabbing and he's stabbing and he's stabbing. And it just felt like it went on for absolutely forever. And blood is everywhere. And then I heard somebody say, um, we've called the police, please hold on. I was thinking, hold on, I don't know how I've managed to fight him off this long. And he stopped. So he walked away and I stood up. And obviously I'm bleeding everywhere. I, I knew, obviously, I'd been stabbed. Eight times I'd been stabbed. And I knew that I'd been stabbed, but I didn't know at that moment the severity. I just thought I need to get to a hospital and get all this stitched up so I can just go home. But he basically then, when I stood up, there was 23 witnesses in the end, all huddled together in a group, standing there, screaming, crying on the phones. And he got in his car and drove off away from the scene. And I screamed at the top of my voice because I was furious in that moment. I said, why did nobody help me? and collapsed to the floor and what I didn't know at that time was I'd actually been stabbed in my heart so I was dying on that tarmac that day because I was lying backwards and the, the way that I'd been stabbed is underneath my left breast I've never been good at biology and I always thought your heart was in the middle so but it actually pierced my heart so I was dying so everybody ran over to me the ambulance came got to, to the hospital had to leave my baby there with strangers because obviously I'm in and out of consciousness and I got to the hospital I just did, all I remember is them putting a mask over my face putting my clothes off and the next thing I knew I'd woke up in intensive care having had open heart life-saving surgery awesome. with all the police around my bed so when I woke up in the morning in intensive care I was in so much shock and in so much excruciating pain as you can imagine and my mum was next to my bed and um, I was trying, I had tubes down my mouth, down my throat. And because I'd been strangled, I felt like I couldn't breathe. So I called her over, she took them out. I said, what's happened? She don't remember what's happened. I said, of course I remember what's happened. I was stabbed, but why have I got all this pain in my chest? And she said, you've had open heart surgery because you were stabbed in your heart. And I was at that moment, the first moment, I was like, I was not stabbed in my heart. I felt like they'd done the wrong surgery on me. And she said, you were stabbed in your heart. She said, you, you're very lucky to be alive and she said the heart surgeon's going to come and speak to you 
a heart surgeon then came and spoke to me and he said in 20 years of being a heart surgeon he had never seen anybody survive injuries like that it was only a miracle he's got no medical science to back up how I was able to survive because once the heart is pierced it takes three minutes for it to stop basically and it would have took about 15 16 minutes to get to the hospital then to get me under he said it just it was a miracle that you survived and my ex-partner was on the run then at the time. It was on the front page of the newspaper. It was on the news. And I just felt in so much shock and devastation that this had happened to me. And the first thing that came into my mind after the, you know, the realisation that this had happened is how traumatic this was and what this is going to do to my life. And I'd grown up being secondary... Um, secondary affected by trauma or other people's trauma not my own thankfully um but a lot of childhood trauma that I've been surrounded with friends and different things I grew up in the inner city of Birmingham and a lot of them had faced childhood trauma as had my ex-partner and I just felt like all these people needed was love and I had it in abundance to give and I hadn't gone through that so at the time it's like a guilt that I hadn't gone through that so I was, I was like okay they just need to be loved and they just need that safety but what I'd seen is how trauma had affected people's lives and I remember lying in that bed in that pain feeling like this is not going to ruin my life because I am a victim I'm not a victim and I refuse to live my life as a victim and I need to have a conversation with my ex-partner so I didn't know anything about restorative justice. I'd never heard that word before, but I needed to have a conversation with him. So that's where I started. And when I came out of hospital four weeks later, um, and they told me that my baby as well was only a fetus, so there was no way that it would have survived. But I just knew in my heart that this was my son because I had two daughters before. So I just knew in my heart that this was my son I'm a woman of faith anyway. And I was like, my baby is going to survive. This is going to be my miracle son. And thankfully he did survive, which he also said was a miracle. So I had him obviously nine months later, a healthy baby boy. Um, so when I came out of hostel four weeks later, I'd lost my job. I'd lost my home because it was a privately rented home. I had the problems with the landlord because I'd been in hospital and it was just a nightmare. So I'd lost my home. I had to move back to my childhood home, my childhood little bedroom with my two daughters. I'd lost my car because it happened in my car and the police kept it as evidence. Um, so I had to claim insurance for my car. It was an absolute nightmare, basically. And I just wanted to heal as fast as possible. That's all that my intention was. And I remember first asking the police who was in charge of the case. He did hand himself in, sorry, three days later, my ex-partner, and said that he'd I'd brought the knife, stab him with it, he'd done it in self-defence. So... That was the first thing that he said. So we had to wait to go to a trial, which was a year later. Um, but I remember asking the policeman, can you get me a meeting with him? I need to have a conversation with him. Still not knowing anything about restorative justice. And he said, no, that wouldn't happen. The crime's too severe. The risk is too severe. Why would you think that could happen? Why would you want to do that? You do know this is a man that tried to kill you, don't you? And I was so taken aback, the way that he was so defensive and he seemed to have a bit of an attitude. And I was like, Yes, I know that. But I need to have a conversation with him. And he said, is it because you want to be with him? And I was I was really, really new to all of this world. And I was just so shocked because I knew what I needed and the reason why I needed it. And to be confronted with such attitude and resistance, I was like, oh, I was like, no, it's not because of that. Well, that would never happen. But I'm a very tenacious person. I don't take no easily but I know that's something that I need something that I want I will fight for it so I proceeded that year that first year in the first four or five months obviously I hadn't got nowhere near trial yet and I didn't know again still about restorative justice so it would have been way too early anyway but I was asked victim support women's aid the victim liaison probation the police the governor of the prison that he was in every single person I could think social worker every person every single service I was hit with the same response which was either why would you want to do that is it because you want to be with him that can never happen that will never happen it's not allowed it doesn't happen in this country it's not going to happen and I just couldn't believe it I was so so shocked 
and I was like, why, why am I getting so much resistance of something that to me makes so much sense? I'm a, always been a communicator and a conversationist. I really believe in talking and talking therapies and, you know, talking for closure. So it just made perfect sense to me. So over, when I got to the trial, it's important to say, when I got to the day of the trial, I was had to have that whole build up thinking, you know, he's going not guilty because he did it in self-defence. And that, because I have such a deep understanding of people in general, not just him, and a lot of people are very angry about that, saying, how can he say that? I can't believe he would say that, you know, you've tried to do this to him. I said, but in order for him to admit that to the police, he first has to admit that to himself. And I know he's not going to be able to admit that he is capable of doing something like that, as heinous as that is. So that's why he's doing that. But when I get there and that day when I'm going to speak, there's no way he's going to be able to say that in front of me in that court. But on the day of the trial, the first day, they ask you again, how do you plead guilty or not guilty? And he pleaded guilty, so I didn't get to go in. And I felt like the energy and the, the bravery and the courage that it took for me to even go into there to face him on that time had just been taken away from me. I'd been robbed of facing him and seeing his face but didn't get to go in so then it went to sentencing and so when it went to sentencing the judge said that he was going to sentence him to life of 22 years but because he admitted guilt on his first opportunity arguably that was not the first opportunity but that's what he said um that he was to reduce it to 16 years and he would served 16 years because of a life sentence so in my mind, I'm like, okay, 16, yeah, so I'll be this age, the kids will be this age. It gives me time to heal before he's going to be free, because as we know, life is not life in prison in this country. Um, so then, uh, three weeks later, I got a letter from a victim liaison officer who was very rude in the process when I was asking her for restorative justice. So much so, in my living room, she told me that I would have my kids ripped away from me if I was ever to have any contact with him, because that's what she believes I was trying to do in this, wanting to see him. Again, I couldn't believe, and that's kind of to get out of my house. She sent me a letter with just two lines, just saying, due to a stiff rule, his sentence has now been changed from 16 years, seven years, seven months. So again, I felt like I've been robbed, contacted the police and the CPS, and they both says to me, um, this is, you know, it doesn't ever happen, but the judge had made a mistake apparently in his ruling and what he should have said is because he wants to impose a life sen a life license on his release he can't impose a life sentence therefore he has to serve half so he'll only do the seven years seven months so now I was just completely like uh, absolutely a ball with a red flag like I need to get to a meeting with him because this whole criminal justice system is a joke in my opinion in my experience for my situation and that's not justice I don't feel any justice in that whatsoever. So I need to see him face to face. By this time, obviously doing a bit of research, I had learned it was called restorative justice, but all the programmes I'd seen, the information I'd seen had all been American based, not here. And there was nothing in West Midlands whatsoever for restorative justice at that time. So that question about PCCs having RJ, there's, that's not, it wasn't always the case that every PCC in the whole country had RJ available and it definitely wasn't at that time so did you know if you had to ask another question Ben what was the next question what was it? Worry, I, I thought I'd let you let you go because you're obviously this yeah. is absolutely well horrible but um yeah very powerful I, I just wanted to ask you so obviously you had that terrible, terrible incident you really really decided you wanted restorative justice do you want to tell a little bit more about why what it was in you that you felt so sure that you wanted to speak to him? So basically, as I said, I'm a victim, I'm not a victim. And I quickly learned, um, you know, I'm an intelligent woman. I quickly learned that all these services that are in place, I would never disrespect the services on a whole and say they don't do great works because they obviously do. Um, and I've mended some of the harm that's been done by those services to me since because I've gone back and revisited and spoke to directors of the companies. And it just felt in my situation, I was just had a bad experiences with each and every service that was out there. And they didn't understand at the time, which was so frustrating for me. It seemed like 
why I was getting so upset and so frustrated is a victim, if you look up the definition of victim, it does not say an inability to think for yourself, an inability to speak for yourself, an inability to know what it is that you need. Now, sometimes I've always said, if a victim knows that they need restorative justice, they know why they need it, but they may not be able to articulate it because you are full of trauma and it's a lot to work through. The mental trauma, I was diagnosed with depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety. Before that, I was a very confident woman. I never had any of those things to deal with. I've got a smooth house. I've got to furnish that house because I've lost all my stuff. I've got no job. I've got to have a baby. I've got to move to an area that I don't know anybody. I've got to move my daughter's school. It was so much things to deal with. And I felt like, yes, I was a victim of an attempted murder because that's what the charge was. And I needed some support, but I knew what I needed, but I needed you to give me the support that I need to get through this because I don't know how to manoeuvre through these um, services and through the legalities of things. And the way that they just kept shutting me down, like, well, no, this is not what you need. But how do you know? Because you don't think it's what I need. Don't tell me it's not what I need because I was literally like this. That's the only way I can, like a visual, like... I mean, for, yeah. Yeah, for three years, I felt like I was stuck. Like, I couldn't sleep. I was suffering from insomnia. So I couldn't sleep for three and a half years. Not one night of a full sleep did I sleep. I went over every single day the conversation that I needed to have with him, what I needed to ask, what I needed, what, what he might say then, what I would say. And I kept going over it. And the main thing was, what I wanted to know was why? Why did you do this to me? How could you do this to me? After I'd loved you for five and a half years, how on earth could you do this to me? Only by the grace of God I'm alive. You should have killed me that day and our child. So nobody can answer that question but him. No one can hold him accountable the way that I can hold him accountable. No court system, no police officers, me. And I need him to look in my face. He left me dying on the tarmac that day as a victim. Now, I need to st stand or sit in his presence, eye to eye, as two human beings that shared a relationship together, that shared a bed together, that have made children together and, you know, shared love together and have a human conversation. And all I needed is someone to facilitate that. It just made perfect sense to me. So why would everybody stop me from doing that when I'm telling you that that's what I need to move on? And I couldn't. It's like my whole identity had become the woman that had been stabbed. That's not what I wanted to be. I didn't even know who Janika was anymore because everywhere I went, that's what I was having to deal with. That's the conversation I was having to have. And it was so frustrating. And as soon as I said that I wanted to have a meeting with him, I lost friends because of it, because nobody understood it. And I just felt like an alien living in this world all on my own. And it was so frustrating. And I just needed to get a little bit of closure. I knew I would never get the full closure. And I think what it was about as well for me is not so much um, what he had to say to me or an apology or remorse. Of course, that would have been, I would have hoped he would have had some remorse, but it wasn't about that for me. It was about what I had to say to him. And it's about me taking my power back. And I mean, so I can't, I, yeah, yeah I think, I mean, frustrating probably doesn't even no. cover how unbelievably irritating, just demoralizing anger inducing it must be to have everyone tell you what's good for you yeah as if they're experts in something that only you experience and it's something which you know when I was talking earlier about the five percent of people who are made aware and you know mm -hmm. the reason one of the problems I think we really have with restorative justice is is, is that gatekeeping you know it's where not everyone not, not again as you said these people do great work but there's this tendency especially with serious crimes especially with domestic violence for people just to say nah you don't know they make these horrible assumptions as if they they assume oh you're getting back together oh you don't know what's best for you it's patronizing at best so patronizing and it's just very very i mean i'm very frustrated hearing i can't imagine how you were living through it and i, I yeah i completely feel the frustration and it's something in the restorative justice world that we need to at why me keep fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting for is to help people make their own decisions no matter what they've been through because you're a person not like a statistic and yeah, yeah it must have been infuriating but to move sort of move forward what was it that what happened that allowed you to to get this this meeting so basically three and a half years I was fighting tooth and nail I'd exhausted every single service that was out there no one would help me 
and because I didn't sleep, I was up one night, three o'clock in the morning, and like I said, I'm a woman of faith, so I believe if it happens for a reason, although those words were absolutely deafening me when I was lying in intensive care, like, why has this happened to me? Like, I can't believe this has happened to me, I don't understand the reason, what's the reason? Um, but I was up one night, three o'clock in the morning, and I was on my phone, and I was crying, and just felt like I was surprised there was any tears left, because I felt like I was crying every day. And a lot, you know, I was hurt, obviously. I was heartbroken. I was traumatised. But I was also felt so unsupported. You know, I'd lived and worked in this city all of my life. I'm 39 now. I was 32 at the time. And I was like, I cannot believe that within the police, within the criminal justice system, nobody understands this process. No one's trying to enable my healing. It's like they're trying to keep me as a victim. And that's what I was so furious about. So I'm trying to walk and live in the victor that I am. And I know what I need to do that. But you're trying to keep me down as a victim because that's where you can support me at that level. But that's not who I am. That's not what I, I want. I, I need to move forward. So I was up three o'clock in the morning on my phone. And it was so funny, really, when I look at it now. But it wasn't at the time. I was must have been thinking in my head. The question that kept going over in my head all of the time is, why me? Why me? Why me? Why has this happened to me? And without realising it, I must have wrote it in my phone, in Google, and then why me came up with a question mark as well. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, what? This is a restorative justice company. This can't be happening. I thought I was seeing things. So I started reading through it. And I was like, oh my gosh. And it's in London. And it's formulated. It's been around for a while. So as soon as nine o'clock come in the morning, I called the number and I was like, you know, spitting my words out so fast. Like, I don't know, 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 know. And the woman was like, I can't understand what you're saying. And I said, you're a restorative justice company. Do you do restorative justice with victims of domestic violence? And she was like, yeah, she, she, of course we do. She said, oh, you know, I'm really sorry for your experience, but it does happen in this country. It can happen in this country and we'll do everything in our power to enable that to happen for you. So I had an amazing, amazing facilitator who's since retired, who's one of the first people to launch it when it came to England, Scotland Yard, many years ago. He used to be a police officer, Brian Dowling. And he came to my house, we had a conversation, asked me why I wanted it. And the thing is with restorative justice that people don't understand and I try and educate services on now is just because you say you want it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to receive it because in the victim code of practice, you they are supposed to be offering victims restorative justice. Now they can get away with doing that via a leaflet, which to me is not acceptable whatsoever. Really not. Because when you are traumatised, you're not always going to, you get so many leaflets, you're not going to read all through the leaflets. And if you've never heard of it before, you're not going to get the full understanding of what it is anyway. Um, but they don't have a right to receive it, which I tell victims as well all the time. So you have to be assessed. Obviously, it's not right for everyone. And there's a process you have to go through, which I understand. It's frustrating for me because I've been wanting it for so long, but it has to be intense. It has to be thorough. And there's a, an assessment period, and then you go through the briefing if you are accepted. And he said to me, you're a perfect candidate because... I was looking at both ends of the um, spectrum. So there's one end of the spectrum that he could be full of hatred and he could be full of anger. And like, well, I'm really upset that I didn't, you know, finish what I started basically. Or it could be full of remorse and full of sorries and love and will you forgive me and all of that. So I had to be prepared, but I'd gone through every eventuality anyway for three and a half years. So I was more than ready. I was like, just give it to me and I want it today. Can we get it today, tomorrow? And he was like, unfortunately not. We have to go through the process. And he has to agree because it's a voluntary process, like you said. And for, for domestic violence as well, for those who don't know, which I also try and tell services about, it can only be victim-led when it comes to domestic violence and sexual violence. The other crimes, it can be offender-led. So they can request and ask for it, which obviously the victim also has to always um, you know, agree to. But it made perfect sense to me when I heard that for domestic violence, sexual violence, they were never going to take a perpetrator-led, only can be victim-led. So they went and asked him the question, and he said, yeah, he was willing to do it. And Did that surprise you? Um, I think, 
not so much to be honest because I felt like I was a bit 50 50 I felt like he may not and he may but it was 50 50 down the middle so and because I've been praying about it so much because I'm a woman of faith I knew I had this vision from a visual person I had this vision of this key that was going to unlock this locked massive huge door and on the other side of the door was my future and the key was the meeting and I knew that this meeting was going to unlock the door to my future. And without it, I couldn't get to the next part of my chapter of my journey of my life. And I was stuck in this place of this trauma. So they had a meeting with him, he said yes. Um, and then because he'd been diagnosed in prison as a schizophrenic and he was on antipsychotic medication, which again, I didn't agree with, but that's a whole other story. Um, on the second meeting, when he went to see him again, before we were supposed to have it, I think it was only going to be six months later, um, unfortunately, he stopped taking his medication and he'd been locking himself in his cell, so his mental health wasn't great. So he said, Look, it's not the time to do it now. I'm really sorry, but we're going to just have to hold back a bit, which was really frustrating. But at the same time, it happens for a reason, and I think I needed a bit more time anyway. So then it did happen 12 months after I first met Brian, and it was the scariest but most empowering thing I've ever done in my life. So as explained already, to walk through the process, it was in the prison. It was in uh, just um, a side room, one of the side rooms, meeting rooms. So there was two facilitators, myself, my ex-partner and a prison officer in the room. And I went in, you can request, do you want him to be there first or do I want to be there first? I wanted to be in there first. And he walked in and I literally started having like, uh, well I was sobbing and it was like what I was supposed like a panic attack really because it was so overwhelming to see him for the first time because the last time I seen him obviously I was that was when he was stabbing me and he sat down and he wouldn't look at me for about 10 minutes he just looked so we're supposed to be facing each other our seats were facing each other but he was looking that way over to the facilitator and he just wouldn't look at me and I just needed him to look at me I needed him to see me eye to eye and so the facilitator said, you know, we all know why we're here. We've all agreed to be here. You know, can we start with what led up to that day? And he just was addressing the facilitator. And the facilitator said, no, no, no. You've agreed to be here. This is Janika's questions. Janika wanted this. You've agreed. You need to address Janika. So when he turned around to look at me, and I was uncontrollably sobbing, he literally, tears just flowed down his face. He wasn't sobbing, but they just silently was rolling down his face. He's just full of shame. And he said, I'm so sorry for what I did to you. I know that sorry is not going to mean anything, but I will never forgive myself for what I did to you and you didn't deserve it. And I just said to him, how could you do that to me? Why did you do that to me? And he gave his reasons and his explanation. That And his reasons were he was that week that I went away. He was very depressed. He'd been hearing voices for weeks. Um, unbeknownst to me, the night job that he had, he'd been taking to cocaine on that job with some friends that he'd met there um and he'd been hearing voices he'd gone to the doctors with his mum some weeks earlier which was on file to say he was hearing voices negative voices and they put him on a 10-week waiting list for mental health assessment um and that day so I just all I remember is I'd been drinking all weekend been taking drugs all weekend I didn't want to see you but I wanted to see you I felt very angry I felt very depressed and very hurt and I just wanted to get through to you for you to understand that we needed to be together. And then I blacked out in the car and I don't remember anything. So I said, well, I'll tell you what happened. So I told him everything that had happened. And he was just sinking in his chair. And the thing is, like restorative justice, another thing I'm not sure that you've mentioned was, because there's different parts that you can, different ways that you can do it. So you can have a phone call, you can have a video call, you can have do it through a letter. Or you can do face to face. It was only ever going to be face to face to me because that's the kind of person that I am, and that's the way I knew I was going to take my power back. And all of what I was experiencing, his body language, the energy that was in the room, everything, I couldn't have done that through a letter or through a phone call. It had to be face to face. So we just had this conversation. It was supposed to be a two hour process, it ended up being three hours. I had to fight the police to get my photo and my injuries as well. So I took those with me because I needed him to see them in front of my face when they were fresh. And I told him all of what had happened, what had done to me, the children, my mother, you know, what I'd lost, um, but also who I am now and what I'd got gained back, basically. 
and I just felt like he hadn't won. You know, you what you tried to achieve, you didn't achieve. And basically, I'm not going to be your victim. I refuse to be. Um, and yeah, it was very emotional. And I had already found forgiveness for him, which is another thing people didn't understand. And it doesn't have to be part of Star's Justice, but it's personal for me. And I always say to people that forgiveness is about setting you free. It's not about, it's not for the other person. It's for you. It's a gift that you give to yourself. And I refuse to let anger and hatred and unforgiveness plague the beauty of the heart that I know that I have. I knew that wasn't good for my children. Um, and that's something obviously I wanted to say. And I said at the end when he'd said, I will never forgive myself for what I've done to you. And I said, well, I forgive you. And I need to do that for myself because I'm not going to hold that hatred for you. And you need to forgive yourself. And that was kind of the ending of the meeting. But at the when he left, um, it was uh, the weight that I felt had been lifted off my shoulders. He literally is a six foot four bodybuilder type man. And I felt like the weight of him had lifted off my shoulders. I didn't know I was carrying it before that weight. And it was the first night that I had a full night's sleep. And the next day, when Brian checked in, because the checking on you afterwards, when he checked in with me, and I was just started talking about future plans that I'd had, and I never realised I was all excited, and I was talking, 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 and at the end, he was like, "Wow," and I said, "Why does it just sound so different?" And I said, "Well, my voice sounded like this yesterday and the day before." He said, "No," he said, "It's just the energy." So you're talking all about future stuff. He said, "All this time I've spoken to you over the last year and a half." I've never heard you talk about any future plans, but I couldn't talk about them because this was holding me back. Now I've done this, I'm enabled, it's enabled me to go forward and it literally was the key to my future. It gave me my freedom, it gave me my power back, gave me my confidence back. And I was very proud that I was able to do that because it was the scariest thing that I've ever done. It was literally like going into a lion's den, that's what it felt like. But I knew that I needed to do it. I knew why I needed to do it. And, you know, all that frustration of everybody standing in my way, I think I could have had this a lot earlier. But at the same time, the fight was necessary because everything happens for a reason. And out of that fight then, because I was so passionate about restorative justice, obviously I'm very honoured and grateful to be an ambassador for Why Me? Well, I'm also an ambassador for the West Midlands Police and Crime Commissioners. And I went with the director of Why Me, Lucy. She asked me to go to a meeting with her to the PCC to meet with the crime commissioner about offering their services for complex cases because Why Me are experts in complex and serious cases. And in that meeting, I challenged the crime commissioner because I was furious. And mm. this is disgusting. All the money that goes into women's aid, all the money that goes into victim support, and none of them know about restorative justice or believe in it or educated on it or offer it. And it's in the victim's code of practice that they are doing victims a disservice and it's not on. And I had a vision for the West Midlands and I told him what that was. And then consequently, long story short, he had to go and he had, they, I was asked to go back for a meeting with him. And he said he'd thought about nothing else but that meeting. And basically he was willing to put 1.4 million into a service for the West Midlands because there was nothing there, which got launched last year in February. And I'm an ambassador for that. And I'm very proud of that. It's because absolutely it's phenomenal. Yeah. No, it's phenomenal. And I, I've, I've obviously we've met, you know, previously Janika and I've heard your story. I'm familiar with your story, but it still makes me feel like I'm welling up when I hear you speak. And I can imagine that PCC a bit like, a bit like Peter Wolf and I described earlier, feeling like he was being hit by a train. And just thinking, oh my goodness, and that is the effect that it, the story has. And how is it? You know, how long has it been now since you had the RJ meeting? Um, that was in two, three, just over three years now. And what what have the last three years been like compared to the three years before? Oh gosh. Oh well, after that, I had it in the November. So the January, I started, I'd had a bit of counselling before that, but I felt like I couldn't go nowhere with it because this was a massive, you know, hindrance, blockage. So I started nine months intense counselling, weekly counselling, started a trauma course for victims of domestic abuse. Um, that was a six month course, which I was able to go to the depths of the depths of everything that I needed to because I'd had that meeting. 
and then after that um I just felt so free I literally felt so so free and the fact I could start my life I started a degree um I support obviously I'm an ambassador for the for you for why me and for the PCC um and I support victims of domestic violence that all of it's on a that was on a voluntary um, basis. And I went back, like I said, to victim support, um, to women's aid and to uh, the victim liaison officers, um, the manager of the victim liaison. And basically sat down, had a very, you know, candid conversation with them. The victim support one came about because I did speaking engagements in um, Birmingham about restorative justice. And obviously I'm very passionate about it. And I think it's the most powerful tool for any victim, the most powerful, because even if the thing that I want to try and get across to people is as well about restorative justice, like we said, it's not about forgiveness. It's very unique. It's very personal. And I say to people all the time that you don't have to have forgiveness in your heart. Whatever it is for you, it is for you. Whether it's, you know, people that have been burgled, I just want to know what did you do with my nan's wedding ring? Where did you put it? You know, just simple questions that yeah. only that perpetrator can answer but also if you're angry you're angry because anger is still a healthy emotion it just has to be managed in the right way you can't go in there you know kicking punching and doing all of that however it's still very necessary for you to go through whatever emotions that you've got because I, I was heartbroken but I was also angry just I mean there's lots of different emotions but the overriding was is I was devastated and heartbroken and shocked so I think that is very very important that whatever it is for the victim it is and they should be allowed to do that and if, with an, a restorative justice experts and facilitators who are experts in that they will go through that process and mm. allow that to happen in the best positive way that is possible to do so um mm. so yeah. i went back and then victim, when i did a, a talk and i said that they hadn't been helpful i didn't realize that the director of victim support was sitting in that room so although I never named names of people, I said it is, was my experience, unfortunately. I, like I said, I'm not going to disrespect the service as a whole, but that was my personal experience. And I'm allowed to tell my experience. And there's wanted to meet with me. And then I had a meeting with all the managers of all the different um, bases in the West Midlands because I wanted to learn from that experience. And I was so humbled and honoured by that because I felt like there was lots of different things that happened within the women's aid and the victim support that are not relevant, so I won't go into it here, but it was a really bad practice, basically, really, really bad. And there was really upset about it. And they said, look, we don't want this to happen again. We want us to learn from this experience. Would you come on one of our training days and train us on restorative justice? So I did. And it was really interesting to me as services, we spoke about it earlier, about the offer and fear, misconceptions and not being educated about it. I threw it out to the room and for all, everybody that worked in victim support all across the West Midlands and said, if I had come into you and said to you, because I remember I didn't know about restorative justice when I was engaged with victim support, I need answers, I need closure, I need to ask him why. Would that have flagged up in your head? That's restorative justice, because that's basically what it is. And I said, I just want you to be honest. And uh, yes or no. So a majority of them said in the room said no. Two of them said yes. And I said, OK, so if you would have known about restorative justice and given my case, would you have offered it to me? And majority of them said no. So then I had to go around and ask honest, because obviously I was happy for the honesty, but it was saddening and frustrating. I said, OK, well, tell me some of the reasons why not. And some of them said, some of the reasons were, I would have felt that it wouldn't have been safe and I wouldn't have felt it would have been helpful. I would have felt maybe is it because, you know, are you going to get into a coercive controlling situation again with him? And obviously some of them are like, I'm really sorry to say, I said, no, just be honest. I want you to be honest. This is, you know, you're allowed to have an opinion and feelings because you're a human being. This is how we learn. Um, and some of them said they wouldn't know how to facilitate that. They were too scared to offer that because they wouldn't want to upset me even more. So, and it's working through all these barriers that people have, which is why every service needs to be trained properly on what restorative justice is. And the point is, you don't have to be a facilitator to offer it. All you need to do 
is to then point signpost them to the right place. Mm. This is the offer you have a right in the victim's code you have a right to be offered restorative justice this is what restorative justice is do you think that's something you might you would like to do or like to look into or like to have a conversation with an expert about a you know a company about because that's all it actually is how can you upset somebody by saying that and you have to be strong enough in your role to say if that person's going to be upset they're not going to, it's not a personal thing towards you. At least you've done your job and you know you've made that offer, had that conversation. Because I don't understand how any service can know that work with victims, that know that it's in the victim's code of practice and not do that. I think it's awful, to be honest. No, and I, I it sounds like your experience was just, as I said before, immeasurably frustrating. And at YME, obviously, we're very committed to trying to work with. Yeah every service that every victim supports as police service pcc service who who needs to be on top of it obviously it's a very mixed pot across the country but in some areas you know domestic violence sexual violence is probably the hardest among Mm. the hardest to to get restored justice for because there's so many fears and misconceptions the thing is ben as well that it's so hard for it's something that it's another fight there's been many fights and I never understood why the fight for my restorative justice was so hard. And I remember when I was fighting for it, I kept saying, why is this so hard? I, it shouldn't be this hard. I, sh- I should be able to knock on a door somewhere and say, excuse me, can I, victim support, I would have thought, or women's aid, can I have restorative justice, please? Yeah, yeah, mm. come in. This is what it is. Let's help you on this process. I thought it'd be that easy, naively. Mm. I didn't understand why it was so difficult. And then when I got towards the end I realized that this fight was never just for me it was for every person that comes be- behind me because unfortunately there will be more victims that are in my situation and when I stood in front of one of the directors again I won't tell her name but one of the directors of Women's Aid she was basically known for saying we're not going to engage in restorative justice because it's not for our victims it's not for my victims one of the things she says so when I sat in front of her, I said, excuse me, what? Whose victims? I'm not your victim. Don't you dare ever address me as your victim. Because if I'm your victim, you need to be owning my scars, my trauma, my flashbacks, my anxiety, all of it. Don't you dare address any of the victims in this service as your victims. Don't take that power away from them. How dare you? That's not your, your decision to make. And she basically, you know, had a very open and quite she's quite aggressive really which was sad me i did have to put in a complaint about her because if you're the director i don't know what hope this service has in this where it is based but she basically had said it's all about coercive control that's always going to be what it's about it's the only reason women would want it and it's all these barriers that people put in place because of their you know um mad crazy thoughts and feelings about it and i've always said everyone's allowed to have an opinion about everything but when you work in a service that supports victims especially you are supposed to be empowering them in my opinion that is what you're supposed not taking the power away from them don't make decisions for them yes you've got to support them and if you know that was a woman's motive by the time she gets through the assessment process with a restorative justice service they would know that that wouldn't be suitable for her that was her motive only because she wants to be with him so let the experts sort that out. Don't you make the decision and you already blocking it to say, no, 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 we're not even going to offer it because that's not for our victims. I was furious about it. So there was a lot, you know, we've come a long way, but we're not really where we need to be at all. And I think people just need to understand that restorative justice is what victims are supposed to be offered. It's very empowering. It's a great and amazing healing tool whether that's just to have you say that you're angry or forgiveness or whatever it is for you, it's a very, very powerful tool that no one should has the right to take away from a victim. No, and I I agree. And why me agrees. And we're, yeah. I know you do. Fighting, alongside, fight, <laughs> fighting alongside you. I mean, that, yeah, I was, as always, Janika, really, really touching, thought-provoking, incredible to hear about, and obviously devastating it in parts, but really, really amazing to hear your experiences and your and your views. Um, I'm sure lots of people, you know, we've got some messages on the chat and people have had to pop out and said things like, oh, thank you so much, Janika, obviously, you know, thanks for sharing your story. 
I, I, you know, I uh, was going to give more time for Q and A, but I'm certainly not, certainly not cutting you off in your flow because it was, oh, it was okay. so great. I just was, if people have questions for Janika, they want to write in the chat for her to answer, or obviously Janika, you let me know if you want me or Morgan to answer as well. But I'm sure you'd be yeah. grand. Um, then uh, feel free to type in. I'll just read some of the comments people had said. Uh, Miles Hamilton fairly said, thank you, Janika, for a very interesting session. You've been very brave to push for the help you needed. I've learned a lot. Sorry, I have to leave now. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, Denise said, thank you for sharing your story, Janika. Very brave of you. And Corin says, thank you very much as well. Um, and I mean, a lot a lot on that theme, Janika, obviously. Janika, oh, thank, thank you for you. sharing your story. You're an incredible woman, said Sophie. Uh, oh, Denise, thank you for hiding. Empowerment is key for the healing process. And uh, Andrea from Victim Support said, thank you, Janika, for sharing your story. So inspirational. I do understand what you're saying about RJ and that professionals do gatekeep, which is very frustrating from an RJ perspective for victims. RJ needs to be used more to meet the needs of victims that the criminal justice system does not give. And you don't appreciate the power of RJ until you've personally experienced the process. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everyone, for your lovely comments. very thank true you. as well. And then... I'll just, you know, I learned so much from hearing you speak through your experiences, Janika. Thank you so much for sharing your approach to life and insights. You're amazing and inspirational, said Kate. Oh, and thank Dawn, you. Dawn said, very empowering. I volunteer with Youth Justice. How can RJ be used for young victims? I don't know if you want to. No, you can answer. Yeah, you can answer. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, yeah I, I'm actually leading a project with YME about restorative, improving restorative practice for young people, which we just started last October for three years. And I would say there's, as we hear from Janika, there's a range of different types of crime, different types of experience where RJ is maybe more and less developed. With young people, it's the area where it's, I think, on the better end. I think it's more infiltrated into youth youth practice. Yeah. And actually, in some ways, you're, right, you're, you're a lot more likely to get offered restorative justice if you're a victim of young persons crime for young person there were still problems i think some of the problems are in my in my personal opinion that uh the reason that rj is more developed possibly among youth services is partly because the focus is so much on the young person who's committed the crime which is obviously very very important i would never doubt the importance of that but obviously the question is you know is it still victim-led are victims still able to people affected by crime still able to drive it through I'm sure the answer will be it varies in different areas, and 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 again, if you subscribe, we'll we'll, we'll send our findings as, as as we as we as we find them over the three years. But yes, it it is used for young people, and I think it's probably more developed offer than it is for for adults. Um, Don says victims don't want to engage. Sadly, which I think it depends. Again, you know, we would never never push. We never ever would want to push. It's up to people, and I think that's why some of the stuff Morgan talked about earlier, saying oh you can have a range of RJ interventions. So if, if both parties don't participate, you can have other sorts of interventions, proxies, other ways, other programs which are restorative in nature, but not restorative justice. But of course, it depends on both parties have to want to take part. And the same can be true the other way around. It could have been the case that Janika's ex-partner said no. Unfortunately, it's a consensual process. Well, I would say as well, I think it's that can be down to, again, a lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. And then this is why I really believe in lived experience. I think, you know, again, I respect academics totally. I think they are amazing. And I think that equally, people with lived experience have a place as well. And they have expert knowledge that academics don't have. And I think that putting them together can be very powerful. And that's what I think then, you know, for, for those young people, for example, in and answer to that, there's probation service um, in Birmingham that work with young people. And they've had some of the um, young people that have gone through the RJ, I haven't wanted to meet them. Some of them have been letters. Um, but when they've come and spoke to the other victims that were not so sure about it and what they'd got from it, they'd realise actually this is something that I want to do actually because it's fear can hold you back lack of understanding lack of knowledge you know not, not if you've got nothing to compare it to you don't know what you can gain from it and you know the thought for some people which obviously I know the kind of person I am so that whatever it done to me I was going to do it anyway and I knew I'd just be okay in the end but I think the the fear 
it's so debilitating. Fear in, in, in its entirety anyway is debilitating. And I think the thought of sitting in the room with somebody that's caused you so much harm or has traumatised you by their actions can really just put you off completely. And, you know, with the best will in the world, you can... Um, facilitators and services can say well you know this can be really good but someone who's been there that can show you and stand there as a living example of this is what it did for me and this is what I gained from it and like I said even if it's just you being able to have your say or ask those few questions it, it is so empowering and I believe that my personal belief is there is no one that will go through an RJ process and not have some benefit for them whatever that is whatever that looks like for them. And with the service that launched in West Midlands last year in February, because it's obviously so new in the first nine months, there was a lot of, you know, people's services in the West Midlands saying, no, I don't think there's a need for it. I don't think it's really going to work. You know, I think it's a waste of money, a waste of time. They did 120 face-to-face -face cases. Thankfully, it was last year, not this year, because of COVID. But in the first nine months, and it was 100% success rate, 100% absolutely amazing for me it just makes me emotional because I just think you know I know what why me do and I sometimes wish why me was in Birmingham <laughs> but you know I was thankful that I got to receive what I received from why me even though it wasn't in Birmingham but I'm just glad that there's something here now and that people can benefit from that and that we love it all the time it's just getting it out there getting the word out there and because one of the things I got from Women's Aid was well, nobody's ever asked for it. You're the only person that's ever asked for it. That was one of the criticisms the director tried to say to me. I was like, how can people ask for something they've never heard of? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, indeed. And also, yeah. like, like you'd mentioned earlier, the idea of, of, you know, when you say you need certain things, it hopefully it would trigger in the mind. That sounds yeah. like a story of justice and someone would yeah. explain it. Which, again, do lots and lots of great work. I'm sure lots of people at Women's Aid do absolutely fantastic work. And this is just... Yeah, definitely. And they do, because I've been there yeah. a long time, as do victim support. And, um, you know, mm. I'll say they do do amazing work. But you just got to embed style of justice into the amazing work that you do as absolutely. well. <laughs> to me, that's it. That's all I'm saying. No, yeah, okay. you're absolutely right. Um, Marcus said, it's a very interesting discussion. I coordinate a project on restorative justice with child victims and relate to basically all your inputs and concerns. In Eastern Europe, where I work, RJ is almost unknown as a positive process for children. This is perhaps where we find more resistance from practitioners and policymakers, and this is why we work a lot on capacity building and advocacy. Big, big thanks to Janika for sharing so much with us. It was very enriching to hear you. Thank you very much, Thank Marcus. You. It sounds Thank really you, interesting. Yeah, it sounds it's interesting, interesting. You know, there's lots of international collaboration among restorative justice in different parts of the world. Different places are ahead of other places, and we're all pulling in the same direction. I think we're all all chasing sort of New Zealand as the gold standard yeah, where definitely. this practice originated. Um, so Joanna said, thank you, Janika, for sharing your story. Very empowering. It's frustrating how the criminal justice system is so corrupt and believe in focusing on the offender, lacking rehabilitative ideals as care for the victim. As undergraduate students, is there anything we can help with? I, I would definitely say to getting the word out there, speaking about it to people, educating yourself on it and really knowing what it is. And I would just, every, everywhere you go, speak about it <laughs> yeah i know we have lots of words out there <laughs> you remind me of our other ambassador Ginny Lucy, who always says that she talks to people on the trains and the buses yeah. to me like it feels like a preacher um yeah. but yeah and also obviously why me always always looking for people who can help with various things you're trying to do you know so do 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 keep in touch with what we're up to and 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 we'll we'll can share more um marcus said if you allow me to share more info on the project here's our page so for anyone who's watching the recording, that's www.tdh.ch slash en slash projects slash i hyphen restore hyphen protecting hyphen child hyphen victims hyphen through hyphen restorative hyphen justice. Oh, there's a there's a, a, a difficult link to read out. Andrea wanted to speak quickly, and I think that's that's very. Yeah, over to you, Andrea. Yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to say thank you, Janika. That was absolutely amazing, inspirational. Um, it's really kind of tugged on me a little bit. Um, oh. But I just wanted to uh, say that I uh, deliver restorative justice in West Mercia, which is quite close to West Midlands. 
Um, and we have during lockdown, I mean, we've actually, you know, gone to town on a raising awareness about restorative justice. Yeah. We've done 50 Zoom sessions with all the police forces, magistrates. Um, yeah. We've got a pilot with Worcester Police on um, response teams at the moment. So we're working with them. We've got 15 RJ champions now. Wow. Um, so, we, you know, we I just wanted to kind of say that, you oh. know, in West Mercy, we really are trying really, really hard um, to push you. it. That's absolutely amazing, Andrea. I'm really had so you don't understand how much that just blesses my heart to hear. Thank yeah. you so much. And previous to this doing this, I worked in the courts uh, with the witness service. And obviously we see lots of victims coming and going from courts. And, you know, when people plead guilty at court, it's almost like that person hasn't got a chance to have their say. And that's a really, really good point of introducing an RJ. Exactly. Conversation, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to ask Andrea, how long um, had has your victim support been involved in restorative justice then? Uh, it, God, it, it's been, I think it's been in West Mercia for eight years. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, wow. and there, there, was, there was quite a big team um wow. and then it kind of got shrunk down which is what happens in the voluntary sector it kind of grows yeah. they go yeah that, that's just you know the nature of the beast um but at the moment there's myself and my colleague karen and we cover the whole of west mercia oh fantastic um and we've got a group of volunteers that help uh, facilitate you know um lower level cases anything serious and complex we deal with personally Oh, fantastic. So when you said you've got champions, are those people that have gone through, victims that have gone through the process or? Uh, Well, yeah, we've got a few, but a lot of them are police officers. So we've got an RJ champion and all the police kind of group so we can feed back to that one person and they can share it. Oh, I see. Um, Yeah, and we did a process with a PCSO for racially aggravated incident with an offender, which was really, really effective so we've wow. got him he's doing a talk for us so yeah oh, brilliant. I just wanted you to know that we are really trying to you know that's amazing I would just say that if you ever needed anything regarding domestic violence or attempted murder I'd be happy to come as voluntary to speak because brilliant I'm thank you honestly if you have my details that's honestly it's fine fantastic well it? thank you yeah thank, thank you so you. much Andrea and thank you Janika there's a couple more a couple people in the comments are doing various you know, Don said, oh, fantastic, I want to hear more, Andrea, and Marcus wants my details. Just to be clear, you should have my email address from, uh, or info at yme.org from emails you've received about the event. Um, I will also pop my email address just to everyone there for anyone who wants to get in touch. It's ben.andrew at why-me.org. So, of course, feel free to get in touch on there. ben.andrew at why-me.org. We're going to have to close off in a sec for overrunning slightly, but I think that's, uh, you know, perfectly fine. Um, I'll read out the last couple of comments. There's Ruth said there's an organization called Peacemakers working in education settings in Birmingham. Someone may have mentioned it already, but I've missed a bit of the session, which they haven't. So obviously feel free to look up more about Peacemakers or other fantastic organizations doing good work. Um, Dawn said she'd like to hear more uh, from Andrea because as she volunteers for youth justice. So if you get in touch, either of you, I can I can put you in touch. Um, Marcus thanked me for the attempt on the spelling of the website. And I'll, you know, I'll give him uh, as I said, hopefully you can take my email from there, Marcus. Uh, and then Kiara, you know, echoed lots of us thinking that Janika, you're an absolute inspiration. She's amazed at how you've used your trauma as a force for positive change. So oh thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. And yeah, so we're gonna close off now. Um, as I said, the, uh, please do feedback in the feedback forms and, uh, and leave email address if you want to subscribe to our newsletter. We'd love to be able to keep in touch with you. And just a huge, huge thank you to, well, to Morgan for all the help with organising the event and for publicising and to Janika for coming along and sharing such an amazing story and, and sharing your views as well. And thank you everyone for coming. It's been really, really great to have these conversations. And I hope that keep flying the flag of restorative justice. It's hashtag was RJ week this week. So if you are Twitterers and Instagrammers and all the rest of it, do do you know do flood the airwaves? It's difficult to be trending these days because there's quite a lot going on in the world. Um, thanks a lot, everyone. I'm Thank gonna you, everyone. I'm gonna stop the recording now.